of which there are many, Mr. Brocklehurst. Your name, girl? Jane Eyre, sir. No sight as sad as a naughty child. Do you know where the wicked go after death? To hell, sir. And should you like to go to hell? To burn there forever? No, sir. Then what should you do to avoid it? I should keep in good health and not die. <laughs> <laughs> do you read your Bible? Sometimes. And the Psalms? Do you like them? No. Psalms are not interesting. That proves you have a wicked heart. You should pray to God to change it. We should keep a strict eye on you. You aren't warned of your deceitful nature. We provide consistency at Lowood, plain fare, simple attire, and unsophisticated accommodations. Hardy and active habits. That is the order of the day at Lowood. Good. That's what she needs. Savage girl. Oh, I've done my best, but it's no use. I can't have her under my roof any longer. She attacks my job. She doesn't know her place. I hope at Lowood you will bring her up in a manner befitting her prospects. Make her useful and humble. I would also request, with your permission, that every vacation is spent at Lowood. Your decisions are perfectly judicious, madam. Good. I'll send her as soon as possible. I'm anxious to be relieved of a responsibility which has become so irksome. I am not deceitful. If I were, I should say I loved you. But I declare I do not love you. I dislike you worse than anyone. I am glad you are no relation of mine. I will never call you aunt again. And if anyone asks me how I liked you, I shall say the very thought of you makes me sick. And you treated me with miserable cruelty. How dare you affirm to that Jane Eyre? How dare I? Because it is the truth. You think I can live without one bit of love or kindness? I cannot live so. I will remember how you violently thrust me back into the red room until my dying day. People think you are a good woman. You are bad, hard-hearted. You are deceitful. <laughs> Teachers and children, you see this girl, you see she is young, you observe she possesses the ordinary form of childhood. Who would think that the evil one had already found an agent and servant in her? Yet, I grieve to say, is the case. My dear children, this is a sad occasion. One of God's own lambs is a castaway. Not a member of the flock, but an alien and an interloper. You must be on your guard. You must shun her example, avoid her company, exclude her from your sports, and shut her out from your converse. Teachers, you must watch her, weigh well her words, scrutinise her actions, and punish her body to save her soul, if indeed such salvation is possible. This girl is a liar. I learned this from a benefactress, a pious and charitable lady who adopted her in her orphan state and raised her as one of her own daughters and whose generosity and kindness was repaid with ingratitude so bad, so dreadful, that at last her excellent patroness was obliged to separate her from her own young ones, concerned that her vicious example would contaminate their purity. She will remain on that stool for the remainder of the day. If Jane Eyre of Lowood School, who advertised in the Yorkshire Herald, possesses the acquirements mentioned, and if she is in a position to give satisfactory references a situation can be offered where there is but one pupil, a little girl, 12 years of age, and where the salary is £30 a year. 
Jane Eyre is requested to send references and all particulars to Mrs Fairfax at Thornfield Hall. Miss Eyre, ma'am? Oh, how do you do, my dear? I'm afraid you've had a tedious ride. John drives so slowly. You must be cold. Come by the fire. Mrs Fairfax, I suppose. Oh, you're right. Do sit down. Please, you needn't trouble yourself. Oh, it's no trouble. I dare say your own hands are almost numb with the cold. Leah, could you make a little hot tea and cut a sandwich or two? Here are the keys to the story. Now, draw nearer to the fire. You've brought your luggage with you, haven't you, my dear? Yes, Mum. I'll see it's carried to your room. Will I have the pleasure of seeing Miss Fairfax? Miss Fairfax? Oh, you mean Miss Verons? Verons is the name of your future pupil. Then she is not your daughter? No, I have no family. Oh, I'm so glad you are come. It'll be quite pleasant living here now with a companion. It is pleasant at any time, for Thornfield is a fine old hall, rather neglected of late years perhaps, but still a respectable place. And yet, you know, in winter one feels dreary, quite alone even in the best quarters. I say alone, Mindley is a nice girl, and John and his wife are decent people, but you see they're only servants, so one can't converse with them on terms of equality. And yet this last autumn, little Adele Derons came, with her nurse, Sophie. A child makes a house come alive all at once. And now you are here, I shall be quite gay. But I mustn't keep you sitting up late tonight. It is twelve now and you've been travelling all day. If you're well warmed, I'll show you to your bedroom. I've had the room next to mine prepared. It's only a small apartment, but I thought you'd like it better. Less dreary than the large front chambers. Do you like Thornfield? I like it very much. Yes, it's a pretty place. But I fear we're getting out of order unless Mr. Rochester comes to reside here permanently. Mr. Rochester? Who is he? The owner of Thornfield. Did you not know he was called Rochester? I thought Thornfield belonged to you. To me? Oh, bless you, child. What an idea to me. I'm only the housekeeper, the manager. And the little girl, my pupil. She is Mr. Rochester's ward. He commissioned me to find a governess for her. Here she comes. Good morning, Miss Adele. Come and meet the lady who is to teach you and to make you a clever lady some day. Certainly, my governess. Adele was born on the continent and I believe never left until six months ago. When she first came, she could speak no English. Now she can make shift to speak it a little. I don't understand her, she mixes it so with French, but I dare say you'll make out her meaning very well. Sophie of the third of us capers and comprend. Person you put in the palace of Kim Monsieur Rochester may ill in this Peru. Would you ask her about her parents? Mr. Rochester neglected to tell me anything about her. Où habitez-vous then? Avant d'arriver à Thornfield? À Paris, à chaque moment. Her mother has passed away. J'ai entendu dire que cette villa très jolie. Oui, mademoiselle. Maman nous enseigne à danser. À dès le verse de l'école, monsieur Vinny a foi. Ma mère, je danse à dès le verse. C'est les genoux, la chanté. Tout ça, je vais chanter. And Dad is going to show us her accomplishments. Oh. later in your lessons. Tout à monsieur. What is Mr. Rochester like? Do you like him? Is he generally liked? The family have always been well respected. Almost
almost all the land belonged to the Rochesters at one time. Yeah, leaving his land out of the question, what is short is his character? I have no cause not to like him. He is considered a just and liberal landlord amongst his tenants, but he's never much amongst them. He has travelled and seen a great deal of the world. I don't say he's clever, but I've never much had a conversation with him. He's a very good master. <laughs> Who is that? Did you hear that, Mrs Fairfax? Uh, a servant, perhaps Grace Poole. Did you hear it? Yes, plainly. I often hear her. She sews in one of the rooms. Sometimes Leah is with her and they are frequently noisy together. Startled me, that's all. <laughs> If you are hurt and need help, sir, I can fetch someone either from Thornfield or Hay. <coughs> Thank you, I shall do. No broken bones, only a sprain. I cannot think of leaving you, sir, at so late an hour. Until I see you are fit to mount your horse. I should think you ought to be at home yourself, if you have a home in this neighbourhood. Where do you come from? From just below. And I'm not at all afraid of being out when it is moonlight. I will fetch someone for you from Hay, with pleasure. Indeed, I am going there to post a letter. From just below? You mean the house with the battlements? Yes, sir. And whose house is it? Mr. Rochester's. Do you know Mr. Rochester? No, sir. I have never seen him. He's not resident, then? No. I cannot commission you to fetch help, though you may help me a little yourself, if you'd be so kind. If you have not an umbrella I could use as a stick? No, sir. Try to get hold of my horse's bridle and lead him to me, will you? You are not afraid. I see. The mountain will never be brought to Mohammed, so all you can do is aid Mohammed to go to the mountain. I must beg of you to come here. Excuse me. Necessity compels me to make you useful. Hand me my whip. It lies just over there. Thank you. Make haste with your letter to Hay and return as fast as you can. Miss Eyre, be seated. Madame, I should like some wine. Not over there, Miss Eyre. Move closer, where I can see you. Cadeau. Do you 
expect a present, Miss Eyre? Are you fond of presents? I hardly know, sir. I have little experience of them. They are generally thought pleasant things. Generally thought? Yes. What do you think? I should like to take the time, sir, before I could give you an answer worthy of your acceptance. The present has many faces to it, has it not? And one should consider all before pronouncing an opinion as to its nature. Miss Eyre, you are not as unsophisticated as Adele. She demands a cadeau clamorously the moment she sees me. You beat about the bush. Because I have less confidence in my deserts than Adele. She can prefer the claim of old acquaintance and the right to of custom. For she says you have always been in the habit of bringing her playthings. If I had to make out a case, I should be puzzled, since I am a stranger have done nothing to entitle me to an acknowledgement. Oh, don't fall back on false modesty. I have examined Adele and find you've taken great pains with her. She's not bright, she has no talents, yet in a short time she's made such improvements. Thank you, sir. You have now given me my cadeau. I'm obliged to you. It is a mead teachers most covet, praise of their pupils' progress. You have been resident in my house for three months? Yes, sir. And you come from? Lowood School. Ah, a charitable concern. How long were you there? Eight years. I taught there for three. The rest was spent as a pupil. Eight years? Well, you must be tenacious of life. I would have thought half the time in such a place would have done up any constitution. You have rather the look of another world. <coughs> I marvel where you've got that sort of face. When you came upon me in Hay Lane, I thought uh, unaccountably of fairy tales. I had half a mind to demand whether you'd bewitched my horse. I am still not sure. <laughs> Who were your parents? I have none, sir. Nor ever had, I suppose. Do you remember them? No, sir. They died when I was very young. And from whence do you hail, Miss Eyre? What is your tale of woe? Pardon? All governesses have a tale of woe. What is yours? I was raised by my aunt, <coughs> Mrs. Reed of Gateshead, in a house far finer than this. I went to Lowood School, where I received as good an education as I could hope for. I have no tale of woe, sir. And why, pray tell, are you not with Mrs. Reed of Gateshead now? She cast me off, sir. Why? Because I was burdensome and she disliked me. Or perhaps you were ill-mannered and badly behaved and deserved to be cast off. I was never welcomed in Mrs. Reed's house. My aunt made a promise to my uncle to bring me up with their children as one of their own as equal. I was treated as a servant girl. Who recommended you come here? Nobody. I advertised and Mrs. Fairfax answered my advertisement. And I am daily thankful for the choice Providence led me to make. She's been an invaluable companion to me and a kind and careful teacher to Adele. Do not trouble yourself to give a character. <laughs> Eulogiums will not bias me. I shall judge for myself. She began by felling my horse. Sir? I have heard a thank for this sprain. Have you read much? Only such books as came my way. They have not been very numerous or learned. You have lived the life of a nun. No doubt you are well drilled in religious forms. Brocklehurst, who I understand directs Lowood, is a parson, is he not? Yes, sir. Yes. And you girls probably worshipped him as a convent full of religiouses would worship their director. Oh no. No? You are very cool. What, a novice not worship her priest? That sounds almost blasphemous. I disliked Mr. Brocklehurst. I was not alone in the feeling. He is a harsh man, but once pompous and meddling. 
He cut off our hair and for economy's sake bought us back needles and thread with which we could hardly sew. Well, that was very false economy. Was that the head and front of his offending? He starved us when he had sole superintendence of the provisions department before the committee was appointed. He would bore us with evening lectures and with nightly readings from books of his own indicting about sudden deaths and judgments which made us afraid to go to bed. What age were you when you went to Lowood? About ten. And you stayed there eight years. You are now there eighteen. Arithmetic is useful. Without it, I should hardly have been able to guess your age. Do you play? A little, but not well. Adele showed me some sketches. Not sure they were entirely of your doing. Probably a master aided of you. No, indeed. Well, that pricks your pride. Let me see. Resume your seat and answer my questions. <clears throat> I see these drawings were done by one hand. Is that yours? Yes, sir. When did you get time to do them? During my last two vacations at Lowood, when I had no other occupation. And where did you get your copies? Out of my head. That head I see there now on your shoulders. Were you happy when you painted these? I was absorbed, sir. And yes, I was happy. To paint is to enjoy one of the keenest pleasures I have ever known. Well, that is not saying much. Your pleasures by your own account have been few. You felt satisfied with the result of your labours? Far from it. In each case, I had imagined something which I was quite powerless to realise. Not quite. You captured the shadow of your thought, but no more probably. You had not enough of the artist's science or skill to give it full being. Put the drawings away. Examine me, Miss Eyre. You think me handsome? No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is something singular about you. A brusque response. What did you mean by it? Please forgive me, sir. I ought to have said that beauty is of little consequence, or taste differ, or something of the sort. Indeed. You should have said no such thing of the sort. Hello. What fault do you find with me? my limbs and all my features like any other man. Allow me to disown my first answer, sir. It, it was only a blunder. It would please me, Miss Eyre, to draw you out, to learn more of you. And speak. What about, sir? Whatever you like. I'll leave the subject to us to you. I am willing to amuse you, sir, if I can. But I cannot introduce a topic. How will I know what will interest you? <coughs> Ask me questions, and I shall do my best to answer them. Do you agree, Miss Eyre, that I have the right to be a little abrupt, masterful and exacting at times, given my age and experience of life? Do as you please, sir. That is no answer. I don't think you have right to command me. Merely because you are older than I, or have travelled the world more than I. Leaving superiority out of the question. You must agree to receive my order without being uh, peeped or hurt by my tone. A smile is all very well, but speak too. I was thinking, sir, very few masters would trouble themselves to inquire as to whether their paid subordinates were peeped or hurt by their orders. Paid subordinates, ah oh, yes. I've forgotten the salary. 
Where you consent to dispense with a great many forms and phrases without thinking it arises from insolence. I'm sure, sir, I will never mistake informality for insolence. One I rather like, the other nothing freeborn would submit to, even for a salary. I mentally shake your hand for your answer. Not three in three thousand governesses would have answered as you've just done. It's nine o'clock, Miss Eyre. What are you about to let a girl sit up this late? Take it up there. And done, Jane, eh? What have you done? Plotted to drown me? <coughs> I will fetch a candle and something dried for you. Please sit, sir, and rest. Someone has plotted something and you cannot too soon find out who it is. Jane. I awoke to the sound of a strange laugh and the sound of footsteps. I heard them go up to the third story. The smell of smoke led me to your room. I used all the water I could lay my hands on to put out the fire. Shall I call Mrs. Fairfax? Mrs. Fairfax? What the deuce would he call her for? Let her sleep unmolested. And I will fetch Leah and wake John and his wife. Not at all! Just be still! You have your shawl on. If you're not warm enough, you can take my coat, wrap it about, sit in the chair there. I'm going to leave you for a few moments. I should take the candle. Remain where you are until my return. You must be as still as a mouse. I'm going to pay a visit to the third story. Do not move. Or call anyone. I have found it all out. It is as I thought. How, sir? I forgot whether you said you saw anyone when you opened your chamber door. No, sir. Just the candlestick on the ground. But you heard an odd laugh. You have heard a laugh like that before, I should think, or something like it. Yes, sir. There is a woman who sews here. Grace Paul. She laughs in that way. She is a singular person. Yes. You have guessed it. Grace Poole. She is, as you say, singular. I shall reflect on the matter. Meantime, I'm glad you and I are the only people acquainted with the precise details of tonight's incident. You are no talking fool, Jane. Say nothing. I shall account for this state of affairs. Now, return to your own room. I shall do very well on the library sofa for the rest of the night. It is near four. In a couple of hours, the servants shall be on. Good night. What? Are you leaving me in that way? You said I might go, sir. Yes, but not without taking leave. Not without a, a word or two of acknowledgement. Not, in short, Jane, in that brief, dry fashion. 
You have saved my life. You have spared me from an excruciating death, and you walk past me as if we were mutual strangers. At least shake hands. You have saved my life. I have pleasure in owing you so immensely that I cannot say more. I can, I can bear this obligation to you. I feel your benefits no burden, Jane. Good night again, sir. There is no debt, benefit, burden, obligation in this case. I knew you would do me good in some way, at some time. I saw it in your eyes when I first beheld you. That smile and expression did not... did not strike the light to my very inmost heart so for nothing. My cherished preserver. <coughs> good night. I'm glad I happened to be awake, sir. You will leave me? I'm cold, sir. Cold? Go then, Jane. Go. I think I hear Mrs. Fairfax move, sir. Then leave me. <laughs>